the question really answered by the Christian worldview is, is God's story, as told in the Bible, the actual story of the world? The secular humanist worldview asks the question, is God even relevant to life? So let's say God does exist. Does it even matter? So in order to grasp that, try to understand it, we have to figure out what the secular worldview is and what it actually teaches. There actually is a clip that can do this in about five seconds for us, so this might be the shortest lecture you have ever heard. Coming from Horton Hears a Who, the philosophy of secular humanism was best represented in one very brief statement. Well, I say if you can't see it, hear it, or feel it, it doesn't exist. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That is our lecture on secular humanism. <laughs> Just <teased. laughs> Yeah, you know you're not going to get away that easy. The philosophy of secular humanism is seen in a lot of different areas, and we'll talk about the actual content of it. But you see it in films like, like Horton Hears a Who, where the lady says that Horton is not actually hearing things from Smallville that actually, it was Smallville, wasn't it? Small, whatever it is. William Ernest Henley actually is, is sort of the philosophical statement generator through this poem called Invictus. You probably have heard this poem before. But he says, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It was a very popular poem up until the 1990s when a man named Timothy McVeigh, McVeigh, Timothy McVeigh drove a moving truck loaded with explosives in front of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City and blew that truck up as a bomb. 171 people, including three unborn children, died in that explosion. Several years later, Timothy McVeigh, having been convicted by a jury of having committed these murders, was sentenced to death. And when he was asked for his final statement, he simply handed the prison warden a piece of paper, unfolded the piece of paper, was the poem Invictus. So in other words, not even taking away my body can stop me from ruling over you. So now when people hear the poem Invictus, it kind of sends chills up their spine. For those who understand a little of the story of Timothy McVeigh, this American terrorist. But a lot of people today still will embrace secular humanism as the default position. They will say, look, if you say Christianity is true, then you're making a claim. I'm making no claims at all. Just what exists, exists. That's the way it is. There is no supernatural explanation for it. In fact, people will even take pains to try to look at scientific ideas to demonstrate what they say to be true. In fact, there was a, actually some brain research that was done on some Tibetan monks and some Catholic nuns, and they found that when those people were involved in meditation, the parietal lobe of the brain right there, the part of the brain that's sensitive to space and time, goes dim. And they said, see, the brain creates the idea of God. This research was so popular that Time Magazine actually did a cover article on it a number of years ago. But even Time Magazine, at the very end of the article, made an insightful observation. It said, at the end of the day, what can never be proven by research is whether the brain creates God or God created the brain in the end, Time Magazine said, it is a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith. Recognizing that even secular humanists are religious people who have faith. One of them, Jacques berlin is a professor at Georgetown University, professor of law. And he says, the secularish are here and now people. They live for this world, not the next. What he's not telling you is they don't believe that there is a next world, or they believe that whatever the content is of that next world, whatever the content is of God's nature and character, that's irrelevant to how we live our lives today. Still, this is interesting, secularists come up with a story of the world to justify their beliefs. 
When I took various history courses and social science courses at the university, I learned this story. It was never put in one simple paragraph like I'm going to read it to you. But every single supposed fact in the story was given to me as a fact of history when I was at the university. And here's how the secular story of the world goes. The followers of Jesus were evil liars whose goal was to establish a macho, macho anti-woman cult. The good people of Rome tried to stop them, but the wicked Emperor Constantine managed to establish Christianity as Rome's official religion anyway. Once in power, Christians intentionally undermined Rome's strength, and this once great civilization collapsed. The church blindly pressed forward in its obsession with control, plunging Europe into the Dark Ages. It took a few hundred years, but Europe was eventually rescued by scientists and philosophers who bravely risked their lives to challenge the church's teaching that the earth was flat and the center of the universe. Occasionally, Christians gained power long enough to burn tens of thousands of witches, massacre millions of natives, and launch cruel crusades against innocent civilized Muslims. Fortunately, due to the brilliance of those who rejected the church's teachings, the Enlightenment saw the triumph of science and reason over religion. However, we must not let down our guard because greedy, ignorant Christians resent the progress made by clever, reasonable secularists, and they will do everything they can to manipulate their way into power to prevent decent folk from having a good time and living their lives in freedom. And thus ends the history of the world. And that's the story that is told. Every single supposed fact in that was given to me in one form or another during my university education. Here's the tricky part. There isn't one single fact in that entire statement. If you break it down and look at every single supposed fact in that statement, they all begin to come apart. And you can find a lot of information in this. One source on this is a guy named Alvin Schmidt, who's a history professor who wrote about the story of Christianity. Another one is a guy named Rodney Stark, no relation to Tony that I know of, <laughs> but Rodney Stark is a professor who has written books, and these are published by major publishing companies. This is not like fringe material. Major books, major releases, major publishing companies showing how this story of history simply isn't so. And yet, it, if it is true, then it justifies a certain way of living. In fact, it justifies a certain treatment of Christianity. So people who say we're going to live and let live very often are the people who are least likely to let you live and let live. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because they believe you need to conform to certain standards of what they believe the story of history requires us to do. In fact, you start to see the religious content of some of these ideas come into play. This was an interesting blog written by somebody who is the roommate of a girlfriend of a Summit graduate. She went to a concert by a Macklemore at uh, Augustana College in South Dakota. And she said in her little article, Augustana's gym was filled with 5,000 people, uh, including her cowboy boyfriend, she said. Uh, it was brimming with excitement and adrenaline, but when Macklemore started to play Same Love, which is about the legitimacy of same-sex relationships, she says the place about collapsed. And then she actually goes on to say this. During the song, almost every person at the concert had their hands up and their eyes closed. It reminded me of church. It reminded me of church. And all of a sudden you think, wait a second. Do you mean people go to a concert to engage in religious worship? And the answer is, not just at Christian worship concerts. There's actually a worldview being proposed there, and it is inspiring a form of worship. Jim Daly, who's president of Focus on the Family, actually said, this kind of idea is enshrined now in law in such a way that unless we do something, it will lead to the persecution of Christians. He specifically refers to a conversation he had with one of the commissioners from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Kai Falbloom. He said, well, what about the conflict between Christianity and your, um, apparently Kai Feldblum is an advocate or a participant in homosexual relationships. What about that relationship between sexuality and religion? And Kai Feldblum told Jim Daly, president of Focus on the Family, this. Well, if I wanted to get married to my partner, 
and a Christian person was working at the county courthouse, if they refused to do it, even politely, and had somebody else come over to do it, she shouldn't work or he shouldn't work in the county courthouse. What about a doctor that wouldn't do in vitro fertilization for a lesbian couple? Well, they should never be licensed by the state because they would be violating my rights. This is one of the three people in charge of equal employment opportunity at the federal level in the United States of America. And she was asked by Jim Daly, he said, well, what about religious freedom? And she said, my sexual rights trump your religious freedom. That would be news to the founding fathers of the United States of America. John Adams called religious freedom the first freedom, because if you don't have that, none of the other freedoms can stand. But now we're in a situation where the idea of religious freedom can be violated because it violates the people who are in power's idea of sexual freedom. And this, in this kind of a world, you actually see the fruit of secular humanism being born out, right? You actually see now that this is not about live or let live. It is about my way or the highway, right? You have to do it this way. So ultimately, people who say there is no God, we just have to make up all of the rules for ourselves, very often in history end up becoming dictators who force their will on everybody else. It is actually a form of theocracy. It's the only form of theocracy we have ever had in the United States of America. And it's based on a secular religion, not a Christian one. So what are secular humanist beliefs? Let's review this briefly. We'll take a look at the chart and kind of see if we can make sense of how all this comes together. First secular humanist belief is that God belief itself is irrelevant. Paul Kurtz was a leading individual in what was called the American Humanist Association and the secular humanist movement, those two words, the word, I didn't define those by the way, the word secular means to an age, like an age of a person. In other words, what's important is people's lives, not all of eternity. And a humanist, of course, is a person who, so uh, in the age of a person, focuses on the best interests of human beings, who decides what the best interests of those human beings are. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, God belief is irrelevant. So Paul Kurtz says in Humanist Manifesto 2, which is actually a document about his beliefs that was widely read, hundreds of thousands of copies were distributed. He said, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves. Notice he's not saying that no deity exists. He's saying that no deity will save us, we're going to save ourselves. Second belief, human beings are good by nature. Abraham Maslow, you ever heard of Abraham Maslow? Study in psychology class. The theory of self-actualization, that your basic needs for food are met, then you concern yourself with the needs for shelter. Your concerns for shelter are met, you're con you're, then you concern yourself with your needs for companionship, love, and so forth. And ultimately, you can become a self-actualized person when all of your needs are met, then you can begin giving back to society. It is a secular form of salvation. Abraham Maslow wrote that idea very clearly in a book called Toward a Psychology of Being. But Abraham Maslow said, as far as I know, we just don't have any intrinsic instincts for evil. Paul Kurtz, in fact, in his writing, thought that human beings were, in fact, perfectible. I told you in one of our times together, you always want to be asking the question, what do you mean by that? Perfectible to what, for what, on what basis, and by whom? Those are the questions you want to be asking, right? Who gets to decide what perfect actually looks like? Who gets to decide? Is it the people who are in charge? Is it the people who manage to put themselves in power? If so, then they are actually the new people, the new kings who believe they bear the image of God and you don't. And you have to do what they say. Third is that society and its institutions are responsible for the evil we do. Think about that for a minute. If human beings aren't evil, but we end up doing things that are evil, if we're not inherently evil, but we end up doing things that are evil, how can that actually happen? How could people who are not inherently evil actually create an evil society? So secular humanists have to grapple with this. And here's how they frame it. Carl Rogers, another well-known psychologist, along with Abraham Maslow said, I see members of the human species like members of other species, as essentially constructive in their fundamental nature, but damaged by their experience. 
So people are fundamentally constructive, but when we're trying to pursue our own interests, we run up against the interests of other people, and because we haven't been thoughtful about it, we're just too focused on our own needs, then we end up damaging one another. Our experiences in turn damage us. We become damaged people. We in turn damage others, and that is the whole secular idea of sin. So God belief is irrelevant. Human beings are good by nature, and society and its institutions are responsible for the evil we do. Those are three core secular humanist beliefs.